Welcome back to Outside Views EU. Today we are diving into a topic that's as controversial as it is complex. The so-called democratic deficit in the European Union. Is the EU truly democratic enough or is there a significant gap between its institutions and the citizens they are supposed to represent? So let's take a closer look at this question. The idea of a democratic deficit is not new. It's been a point of discussion for decades, raised by critics and scholars alike. The core of the argument is that the EU, as it stands, lacks the kind of democratic accountability that we expect from our national governments. But what does this mean in practical terms? To start, let's think about how decisions are made in the EU. The European Union has several key institutions involved in lawmaking. The European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union. Each of these bodies has a different role and it's in their interaction that we can see the complexities and perhaps shortcomings of EU democracy. First, there's the European Commission. The Commission is responsible for proposing legislation. It's made up of commissioners, one from each member state, and these commissioners are appointed by their respective governments. However, the European Commission itself is not directly elected by EU citizens. This is one of the main arguments for the existence of a democratic deficit. The body initiating laws lacks direct electoral legitimacy. Then we have the European Parliament. This is the only EU institution that is directly elected by the citizens of Europe. The members of the European Parliament or MEPs are chosen every five years in elections across the member states. This gives citizens some voice in the EU legislative process, but the Parliament's power is shared with the Council of the European Union. And here's where things get tricky. The Council of the European Union, often simply called the Council, represents the member states' governments. So national ministers from each country come together to negotiate and to adopt EU laws. Unlike the European Parliament, these ministers are not elected by the EU as a whole. They are national representatives. In essence, while the European Parliament brings a democratic element to EU lawmaking, it shares power with an institution that is, let's say, indirectly elected. This division of power is at the heart of many debates about the EU's democratic credentials. Critics argue that the Council and the Commission hold too much influence compared to the directly elected Parliament. For many, this structure feels distant and complicated, especially compared to the more straightforward parliamentary systems of national governments. Another element that often comes under scrutiny is the European Council. This is where the heads of state or the governments of the EU countries meet to set the overall political direction of the Union. And the European Council is a powerful body, but like the Council of the European Union, it's not directly ac accountable to EU citizens in the same way a national parliament would be. The concern here is that the decisions that significantly impact EU citizens are made behind closed doors by leaders who may prioritize national interests over European ones. And this has led to accusations that EU is an elitist project where real power lies with unelected or indirectly elected officials. On the other hand, supporters of the EU structure argue that it's a necessary compromise. The EU is a union of sovereign states, even if some deny that, and maintaining a balance between national interests and collective European action is challenging. Direct democracy, they say, isn't always practical at the supranational level. And they also point out that the European Parliament's role has been significantly strengthened over the years. And with the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament gained more power in the legislative process, becoming a co-legislator alongside the Council. And this has helped to bridge the gap between EU citizens and the laws that affect them. 
Moreover, the so-called Spitzenkandidaten process introduced in recent years has tried to create a more direct link between the choice of the President of the European Commission and the outcome of European elections. In theory, this process allows voters to indirectly influence who leads the Commission by voting for the political party they prefer. Yet even this process is not without controversy. It's not legally binding and in some cases the European Council has chosen to bypass the lead candidate, leading to frustration and a sense that citizens' voices are not being fully heard. There's also the issue of voter turnout in European Parliament elections. Turnout has traditionally been lower compared to national elections, though it did see an increase, for example, in 2019. Low turnout is often cited as evidence that EU citizens feel disconnected from the European institutions, that they see the EU as something abstract, far removed from their everyday lives. And this sense of detachment is a critical aspect of the democratic deficit. People are more likely to feel represented and engaged when they understand and trust the institutions that govern them. The complexity of the EU's decision-making process and the perceived distance between Brussels and the average citizen contribute to the feeling of a deficit in democratic legitimacy. So where does this leave us? Is the EU sufficiently democratic? Well, it's clear that the EU is not a straightforward democracy in the way most of us understand it at the national level. Its institutions are designed to balance the interests of member states with those of the broader European community. And this balance inevitably makes the system more complicated and it can create a sense of disconnection. However, it's also worth recognizing the efforts that have been made to improve democratic accountability. The increased powers of the European Parliament, the introduction of the Spitzenkandidaten process and initiatives aimed at enhancing transparency are all steps in the right direction. Perhaps the real question isn't whether the EU is democratic enough, but whether it is democratic in the right way for a supranational entity of its kind. Can a union of 27 diverse countries, each with its own history and interests, ever have a system that fully satisfied the democratic expectations of all of its citizens? It's a difficult question and one that doesn't have a simple answer. What is clear though is that the EU must continue to evolve. If it wants to maintain legitimacy in the eyes of its citizens, it must keep finding ways to bridge the gap between Brussels and the people. Whether that means more power for the European Parliament, greater transparency in decision-making or new forms of citizen participation, these are the debates that will shape the future of the Union. In the end, the concept of a democratic deficit in the EU is as much about perception as it is about structure. If citizens feel their voices are being heard, if they feel connected to the decisions being made, then the deficit narrows. If not, the sense of disconnect grows. So thank you for joining me today on Outside Views EU. And this topic is complex and the debate is far from over. But understanding these issues is crucial for anyone interested in the future of Europe. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Is the EU sufficiently democratic or do we need major reforms? So I'd love to hear your perspective. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged and keep questioning. And the next video is right here in the end screen.